I'm sure many people have wondered about how to regenerate inner cities or cure urban blight and get things going again. With that in mind, let me share a screen here. This here, as I scroll up this article from The Guardian from a few days ago, was the great idea of Hackney Council from a few years ago. This was the idea of the former mayor of Hackney, Jules Pipe. I'll take you through this. This, if I walk and lock my door, this wonderful sort of lovely boarded up area is about five minutes walk away from me. If you go to the left, you'll find a Tesco's. So there's also a Nike store, which normally has some burly security guards on the door for rather obvious reasons. This was a plan, as the article notes, to take old ra railway arches in a run-down area of East London and turn them into a high-end fashion shop. Nothing nothing could ever go wrong with such a plan in an area like Hackney, could it? No, 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 no. Um, in any case, um, <laughs> when you were growing up, what if you're my age, which is older than dinosaurs and uh, in early middle age, I'm 51, you probably remember what you found in railway arches. You found garages, carpet shops, occasionally the odd other thing, like maybe a used goods shop or something like that. You didn't find luxury clothing shops in areas like Hackney. And anyone who's familiar with Hackney and the area is near Hackney Central, which is this is around the back of and not too far from, will know this was a plan that was doomed to failure. You might as well stick a chocolate teapot next to Mount Ethna and full heat and try and make tea in it. The, uh, the person writing this, who is a Simon Osborne, has done an interview with um, a gentleman who grew up in the area, Al Alvin owusu Fordwell. And I apologise, Alvin, if I've mispronounced your name there. If I have, please contact me if you ever see this. In any case, Alvin recounts growing up and seeing the businesses there. As a kid, he had little need for discount offers, furniture, or the free Krypton tune that came with a service at one of the car garages attached on the railway line. I see Alvin remembers the same garage as I do. I always wondered what the hell the Krypton tune was as well. I, I presumed it made the car invulnerable or, or able to do heat vision or something. But in any case, at least a car garage fills some useful function. People might use it. The likelihood of them shopping in shops where the average shirt is 100 quid was far less of a, a given. And as Alvin notes, I knew these businesses had a function. Rain begins to fleck his glasses. We stand a wedge of land where the right busy road bends close to the tracks. But it's like you didn't know they're there until they weren't. That's quite right. They kind of sat there in, in their little arches for many years. And we didn't even really notice it. Alvin also notes the area has a rather complicated history and that he grew up in one of the larger housing estates and the history of gang violence. This strip was young, if you were younger and not from this area, well, it was complicated. Yes, the infamous postcode wars and issues like that. In any case, I'm not going to read all the article out, but I thought it was hilarious to note um, the plan by Jules Pipe and and the, this in, reinvestment sort of scheme, which, of course, which, by the way, the marvellous Bojo has a hand in. Soon after the riots, the Greater London Authority, then led by Bor uh, Boris Johnson, a man of infinite wit and charm, <laughs> announced a £70 million fund to invest in the long-term regeneration of some of the worst affected boroughs. Money was put into various schemes, including an employment centre in Harringay and reductions in business rates in Croydon. In Hackney, the council would invest 1.5 million in a visitor attraction. I don't know what that what that was meant to be, and in an enhanced retail circuit, Parvard in Bashers products that would soon raise eyebrows. Yes, rather than raising them, people giggling under them. Hackney Walk was a luxury fashion hub that would occupy 12 of the old arches on Morning Lane after the existing businesses had been kicked out. The 100 million pound scheme was conceived by a developer and funded largely by his backers. It also included 3.7 million quid from Network Rail, which owned almost 4,500 arches across Britain. Network Rail are 
an organization that can never be accused of wasting money in any way whatsoever. I would I would never claim such a thing. The mere speculation of such a thought has never even begun to formulate the vaguest possibility of crossing my mind. Architect David Ajay was brought in to rearrange a slice of the capital's Victorian transport infrastructure, traditionally where small business could survive on affordable rents, as a monument to luxury retail was spiking new and golden glass for aside. Yes, because in the Victorian era, they normally stuck up something that looked like a cheap low-rent disco. <laughs> I'm sure they did, David. The development also included several surrounding shop fronts. Yes, it did. And as I noted, the Tesco's is still there because we all need a, a loaf of bread and we all need a bottle of milk. But even that's kind of, there's talk about downsiding it. Zinger. The master plan was sold as London's answer to Bicester Village, the Oxfordshire designer outlet. There's only one problem with that. This isn't Oxfordshire and it's a rather different environment. And it had the full support of the council. I'm sure it did. Funny enough, the man called Jack Baswari, who was involved in this, the developer, has declined to answer Simon Osborne's questions on the phone. How surprising. Piper, who left Hackney later in 2016 to become one of London's deputy mayors, acknowledged some of the scepticism in a speech at the event. I imagine scepticism is an understatement put it mildly here we have another photo of it this is more or less what it looks like today you can see that those marvelous sort of gold shutters looking like a, a blake seven set from the 1970s and looking as tatty as heck that's really more or less exactly what it looks like now it looks like a complete mess and nobody seems to be interested in it Alvin, who seems to have half a brain and would have been much better put in charge of this project because um, no, noticed almost half of Cackney's children grew up in poverty and instead of pushing into money into that they made this yes indeed Elvin uh, a complete waste of money uh, the amount of house that could have been built for that or social repairs done or facilities for the disabled is huge no instead we made a luxury shopping uh, bit that was very rarely used and very few people shopped in. As the article goes on to note, Google Street Bayer allows you to rewind it. You can see what it looked like before for it. Yes, it looks a bit rough and ready where you had a carpet wholesaler and a furniture store called Steptoe and Son, as it notes, but it, they were actually used. People did buy things from them and they did go in and out of them. They weren't just dead businesses there for people to hang about in. As the article ends, Hackney Walk is a ghost town. Shutters are broken, the slate is broken, crumbling, and graffiti chipboard covers the smashed in former entrance to Gibbs and Hawks. Brackets done until last December held up a giant nooky swoosh. Still hang from one of the new buildings. Its sister store at the eastern end of the development has never been occupied. Only one shop remains open at the time of writing. Present, which sells stone iron. I didn't even notice that was still open. Simon Osborne wrote this seven or eight days ago. It's so messy and rough there, and the rest of the shop's fronts look so distraught that I didn't even notice that last one was open. I noticed the assist one of the assistants, though, notes the shutters stopped working years ago when we got run raided. How surprising. Alvin notes at the end, I ran some workshops recently on how young people would redesign the neighbourhoods for creativity, and this place came up a lot. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It's a local legend for how to waste money. They talked about creative workspaces and studios, and there's another use that could have been had from the space. There's plenty of creative types of people in the area. There could have been things like local shops open by people with ideas to run their own small businesses. But no, instead we had this silly idea, not the last and not the first silly idea Hackney Council will have, because the local people are just little people to play with and push around. And we will have people putting endless pamphlets out about regenerating things or fight, or helping the area along, but the actual involvement of people in the area isn't there. I'm going to leave this article up and a link to it so people can see. 
and can actually see m- more comments by people, including some of the former business owners like Amir Khan, whose family owned the garage there, and they were really upset to move out. This gives you an idea of the human cost of this silliness. Yes, it sits next to the well-known Burberry's factory, but that had an established presence and a kind of it's a kind of running joke that if you walk past that, you'll get loads of people buying stuff. None of these stores have that presence or ability to attract trade. And here we have Guy Nicholson's his council's deputy mayor, current work with a talking about a brief for regeneration in the period um, George Pipe was sort of mayor. You can see that name, Guy Nicholson. It's a, a very hackney name. These people seem to basically view the locals as having virtually no brains or wit. They created a scheme that's basically failed and cost a huge amount of budget. I'm going to end by on this shot because you can see what it... it a nice wide angle shot of it. The building to the far left where my mouse is, is is mostly empty. No one's ever rented space in it. It's a complete waste of time. These buildings aren't very well maintained now. They've been ram raided. They're boarded up and no one knows really what's going to happen to them. I would suggest to Hackney Council, perhaps you might wish to involve we poor little local people in your next wonderful schemes and not presume that we are just, uh, you know, the equivalent of idiots. These gentrified schemes don't even work for for anyone because no one, even the more rich people moving into Hackney with more disposable income, could afford to shop in these shops. There was very little trade ever in these shops. I'm sure we'll have another wonderful scheme to replace it, though, with something similar. I hold little hope of it being used in any meaningful way.